Mandy and the Cherokee Legend Chapter 11 Spreading the Word Well, we might as well all go back to bed, Elizabeth told the girls. It'll take them a long time to get through in town and get back here. The girls reluctantly went back upstairs, but soon were fast asleep. Snowball curled up close to Mandy. It seemed no time before the rooster was crowing and they could hear Morningstar in the kitchen. The girls quickly got dressed and went downstairs. Elizabeth was setting the table. I hope they got to town all right. Mandy stretched and yawned. <sighs> Those people are awfully mean and rough. I'm sure they got there all right. They tied those two with enough rope to wrap around the house, Elizabeth said. Eat, Morningstar smiled, pointing to the table. The girls laughed, and at that moment, Uncle Wirt came through the door. He glanced around for the men. Where are Ned and John? He looked puzzled. Joe and Demar captured the people who set fire to the barn last night, Mandy said matter-of-factly. And... They've all gone to Bryson City to turn them over to the authorities. Uncle Wirt stood there listening in amazement while they explained what had happened the night before. He breathed a loud sigh of relief and sat down at the table. <sighs> Not Sonny. He could hardly believe it. Did he ever come home, Uncle Wirt? Andy asked. No, the old man replied. Never came home. Everyone looked at one another wondering where the boy could have gone. Mandy thought he must be ashamed for what he had done and is staying away long enough to get the nerve to face his family. Uncle John, Uncle Ned, and the boys arrived back from town before they had finished eating and sat down at the table to join them. Joe and Demar began eating as though they were starving. I'm glad you were all back safely, Elizabeth said. Aren't you going to tell us about your trip? Yes, yes, the law was mighty glad to get our hoodlums. Seems they were wanted in quite a few counties for several different offenses, John related. Now we can all breathe a sigh of relief. We take gold to bank, Uncle Wirt reminded them. As soon as we can eat and get it loaded, Uncle Wirt, Uncle John replied. Hurry, take away gold, Uncle Ned said. Once it's safe in the bank, we'll inform the Cherokees of its existence, Uncle John stated. How do you plan to do that? Mandy asked. Council powwow, Uncle Ed told her. They tell people. How will all the people decide what they want to do with the gold? She asked. They will take a vote. A place will be set up in the council house on the Cherokee reservation, Uncle John explained. Joe finally laid down his fork. Boy, that sure was good. Now I have the strength to help load that gold. Uncle Ned rose and took a rifle from the wall. Uncle Word examined his own gun, and John picked up his from the other end of the room. Guns? Elizabeth looked alarmed. We need all the protection we can get to get this load into town. You never know what kind of trouble we might run into, John assured her. I know how to use one of those rifles, Joe spoke up. Can I carry one too? I do have one more. You and DeMar can decide between you which one will carry it, John said as he reached for the other gun standing by the bed. Joe took it, then looked at DeMar. Here, you carry it the first half of the way to town, and I'll carry it the second half. Fair enough, the Indian boy said, taking the gun. Careful now, the guns are already loaded, John cautioned them. The girls wanted to help, of course, but were waved aside as the men and boys loaded the gold into the wagon. It didn't take long. Morningstar brought out several quilts to cover the sacks scattered on the floor of the wagon. Joe and Demar perched on top of them while the three men climbed into the driver's seat. Please don't be too long. We'll be worried, Elizabeth called to them. We'll hurry back, John promised, waving to her. Then he instructed everyone to keep his gun out of sight. We don't want to appear too well armed could look mighty suspicious. Mandy stood watching them pull into the road. Then she lifted her face to the sky. Please, God, get them there and back safely. I trust God to take care of them too, Sally said, touching Mandy's shoulder. I have asked him into my heart. 
Oh, how wonderful, Sally. Mandy hugged her. Isn't it good to be able to pray and trust God for everything? It sure is, Mandy, she answered, smiling happily. The men arrived at the bank in Bryson City just as Mr. Frady, the banker, was opening up for the day. He was a short, fat, nervous little man, and he jerked around to look at the wagon pulling up at the door. Three men and two boys. That could mean trouble, he thought. But then he spotted a familiar face under a wide-brimmed hat. John Shaw! He hurried down the steps to greet him. It's been a long time. Wilbur, it's good to see you, old man, John returned his greeting. We are in desperate need of your bank right now. He lowered his voice. We have about a bushel of gold under these quilts, and we need a safe place to keep it. Wilbur's gray eyes grew round behind his spectacles. A bushel of gold? Are you joshing me, John? No, sir. It's real gold, John replied, chuckling at the banker's reaction. If I didn't know you, John Shaw, I'd say you just pulled off a big robbery, Wilbur told him. Come on in. He opened the door and the two of them stepped inside. Let me open the safe before you bring it in, the banker said, stepping to the large, heavy door at the back. How about if we drive around to the back door? It won't be so public that way, John suggested. Of course, that's the safest way, Wilbur agreed. They swung the wagon around to the back door and hastily unloaded the gold into the bank safe. No one was about, and Wilbur kept the front door locked until they were finished. Now that we have it all in here, tell me, where in the world did it come from? And what are you planning to do with it? Wilbur asked John as the others returned to the wagon. It's very confidential right now, Wilbur, but we'll have it off your hands in a few days. We want to keep it quiet so there won't be a robbery. Wilbur wiped the sweat from his furrowed brow. Well, I should hope not. How many people know about it? Just Uncle Ned and Uncle Wirt and the rest of my family. And Demar, the Indian boy, was, John told him. I promise not to discuss our plans right now. But if you do hear anything about a mysterious pile of gold, pretend you never saw it. Is it a deal? You bet, Wilbur agreed. But please don't leave it here too long. I'd like to sleep at night. We'll see you in a few days then. John waved as he left by the back door and joined the others in the wagon. Glad job done, Uncle Ned said with a sigh of relief and he picked up the reins, and they moved through the alley and into the main street. Well, it's up to you and Uncle Wirt now to get the word out, John reminded them, but don't tell anyone where it's being kept. The two Indians left John and the boys back at Uncle Ned's cabin and went directly on their mission to tell the Cherokees about the gold. Shucks, we didn't even get to use the rifles, Joe complained as he handed the gun back to John inside the cabin. John hesitated then said, go ahead and try it out. You and DeMar can go back into the woods. You'll find more ammunition in the box over there. Just be careful. The boys were overjoyed. Thank you, Uncle John, Joe beamed, taking the rifle back. Thank you, DeMar added as the two headed for the door. Mandy called after them. You be careful, Joe Woodard, and don't go shooting somebody you hear. Joe stopped and turned laughing at her outburst. <laughs> Mandy, you know I have my own rifle at home. This won't be the first time I've used one. Yes, but this is a strange place, and that's Uncle John's rifle. And I know you've never used that one before, the girl answered seriously. Joe's face turned red as everyone smiled. If I didn't like you so much, Amanda Shaw, I'd say something mean. With that, he and DeMar hurried out the door. Little did Mandy know how close the two boys would come to shooting someone. They walked on through the woods for a while, looking for an appropriate place for target practice. The trees were dense and it was hard to see very far ahead. Then they came to a small clearing. How about here? asked Joe. Good, the Indian boy agreed. Joe shot at a broken limb. Suddenly, there was a loud clanging noise. The boys froze in silence, listening. Then it came again. What's that? Joe whispered. Sounds like an animal caught in a trap, DeMar returned the whisper. Careful, it could be dangerous. He slowly crept forward, Joe. Fall 
The clanging sound grew louder, as if to beckon them on. I think it's behind that bush over there, DeMar said softly, pointing ahead. They cautiously moved toward the bush. Then suddenly they caught a glimpse through the leaves of what lay on the other side of the bush, and they stopped in shock. There, completely helpless in an abandoned trap, was Tsani, his foot tightly secured by the metal spring. He looked at them with a guilty stare as they came into view. The clanging had stopped. Not you again! Joe slapped his hand to his forehead in exasperation. Seems all we do is get this boy out of trouble, DeMar remarked. Would you please get this thing off my foot, Sonny sounded demanding. That's all I want you to do. The boys looked at each other, and then at Sonny's foot. It had been bleeding and was very swollen. Evidently, the boy was in a lot of pain. Joe stepped aside with DeMar so they could talk. I don't see how we can get that thing off his foot, Joe whispered. We don't have the tools. And besides, his foot is all swollen. Let's go for help. He'll think we're just leaving him alone. DeMar nodded. They walked back to Tsani and shook their heads. I don't think we can help you. If we turn you loose, you'll just get in more trouble, Joe said to him. This way, we know where you are. You do not deserve any help, DeMar added. Sonny looked at them in shock. Please, just release my foot. I'll get home somehow by myself. No, we cannot help you, Sonny, Joe insisted. We don't have any tools to release that spring. Joe and DeMar turned and walked away. When Sonny realized they were not going to help him, he called and called after them. Please, please! Once out of sight, Joe and DeMar started running toward Uncle Ned's cabin. They were almost breathless when they finally got there. Uncle John was chopping wood by the barn and saw the boys coming. He dropped the axe and hurried to meet them. Uncle John, we found Sonny, Joe told him, handing him the rifle. He's caught in a trap in the woods. We told him we would not help him, DeMar said. We didn't want him to know we had gone for help. Let him worry a little after all his meanness, Joe added. Let me get some tools and we'll go see what we can do, Uncle John said, shaking his head. He certainly gets into more trouble than anyone I've ever known. We'll need a blanket or something to carry him back. His foot is in pretty bad shape and I don't think he can walk this time, Joe told him as John walked toward the barn for tools. Ask Morningstar for one while I get the tools, John replied. Morningstar got a blanket, some bottles, and a cloth from the shelf and rolled it all up together inside the blanket. I go too, she declared, special medicine. Elizabeth understood. She wants to go with you to doctor him with her medicine. That's what's in the bottles. Mandy was thinking aloud. You see, you should never tell a lie. He said he couldn't walk before, and it was a lie. Now he really can't walk. I think it happened to him because he lied. Yes, he is bad Cherokee, Sally agreed. You should see his foot. I know he can't walk this time. He must have been caught in that trap ever since we chased him night before last. We lost him in that direction, Joe told them. Go. Morningstar went outside to join John as he came from the barn. The boys followed. It was quite a job prying the trap from Sonny's foot because it was so tightly secured in the swollen flesh. The foot was extremely painful to the touch, but John tried to be as careful as he gently but steadily freed the flesh from the prongs of the spring. When the foot was finally free, Morningstar washed it with liquid from one of the bottles. Sonny winced and bit his lip in pain. Then Morningstar wrapped it in a clean piece of cloth and stood up. Take him, she said, pointing to the boys. John and the two boys laid Sonny on the blanket, rolled the edges of it, made a swing to carry him. Since Uncle Ned's house was much closer than Sonny's, they carried him there and laid him on a bed downstairs. Morningstar administered more of her medicine. You boys go tell his mother he is here 
And when Uncle Ned and Uncle Wirt come back with the wagon, we'll take him home, Uncle John told him. I'll be outside. He went out the door, and Joe and DeMar left on their errand. The two girls had been watching the whole thing from a distance. Sonny had ignored everyone until now, and had not spoken a word. Mandy came over to his bed now. I'm sorry you're injured, Sonny, but the Bible says you reap what you sow, and you sure have sowed some wild lies. I think you'd better pray about it. We'll all pray for you. Sonny looked at her sullenly. What I do is my business, not yours. You've been messing in our business, Sonny. That's how you got hurt, she reminded him, standing up and straightening her skirt. Now that you're really hurt, maybe you won't be able to mess in our business anymore. Elizabeth stepped in. Amanda, why don't you and Sally go outside? Let Sonny rest until his grandfather gets back. Yes, mother, and he answered as she scooped up Snowball and turned to Sally. Come on, we'll see what Uncle John is doing. Elizabeth did not uphold the things that Sonny had done, but she could see how weak he was, and she didn't think it was the right time for him to be reprimanded. Morningstar brought him a bowl of soup, and cradling the boy's head in her lap, she fed him with a spoon. He didn't say a word, but greedily swallowed the broth. Joe and DeMar came back, bringing Sonny's mother with him. She ran to her son, fell to his side, and started weeping. Joe and DeMar looked at each other and went back outside. When Uncle Ned and Uncle Wirt finally came home with the wagon, John stopped them. No use to unhitch the wagon, Uncle Ned, John told them. We'll be needing it. Uncle Wirt, the boys found Sonny in the woods. He's inside. He's really been hurt this time, I'm afraid. The two Indians went inside and came back out shortly, carrying Tsani on the blanket. They put him into the wagon and helped his mother climb in beside him. Please hurry back, John said as they pulled away in the wagon. I want to hear what you've accomplished today concerning the gold. Soon, Uncle Ned called back. As they all sat around Uncle Ned's table later that night, the old man told his news. Powwow tomorrow, council house, he said. Told Cherokee Papoose, found gold. Cherokee no want gold. But you did get all the chiefs to agree to let the Cherokee people vote on what to do with the gold, didn't you, Uncle Ned? John asked. Cherokee vote powwow tomorrow, council house, the old man answered. You mean you can get all the people together to vote on something that fast? John asked in amazement. Uncle Wirt spoke up. Tell one Cherokee, Cherokee tell another Cherokee. News travel fast. Mandy smiled at the way he put it. You mean when you tell one Cherokee something, he will tell another and so on until they all know. Uncle Wirt nodded. Sure has been a busy day for the Cherokees, Joe whistled. Imagine passing the word to over a thousand people in one day. Approximately 1,300 to be exact, John said. Of course, the families are large in most cases, and they live in large family groups together. That's still a lot of people, Mandy agreed. So now all the Cherokee people know about the gold, John asked again. Yes, all know, Uncle Ned nodded. Did you tell them to come to the council house tomorrow and vote on what they thought should be done with the gold, John continued. He wanted to be sure they understood each other. Yes, Ned said. Mandy, Sally, and Joe all looked at one another. Just think, we are the cause of all this. Joe laughed. I feel kind of good about it when I think of all the good it will do them. I'm glad to be part of it, Sally said. I hope the people decide on a good use for the gold. Well, I guess we'll know tomorrow, Mandy said. And then, turning to Uncle John, she asked, Can we go over to the council house to watch tomorrow? Her uncle hesitated, looking at Ned and Wirt. Papoose go. Papoose Cherokee. Papoose vote, Uncle Ned told her. You mean I can vote too, Uncle Ned? Mandy was excited. Hmm, old man nodded. 
Can I go along for the ride even though I'm not Cherokee and can't vote? Joe asked wistfully. Uncle Ned and Uncle Wirt both nodded. Go. The four youngsters discussed the matter long into the night after they'd gone up to bed. The next morning would hold more excitement for them. It would be a long day to be remembered. And we'll read Chapter 12 next time. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks for watching. Love you guys. Bye-bye.